My name is Saptak Sen. I work as a group manager uh, at Hortonworks in the partner solution engineering team uh, for last two and a half years. And before that, I worked for Microsoft for about 13 years, including on HD Insight. And I have with me uh, my colleague, Ginny Kroll. Ginny, do you want to introduce? Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Good morning. I'm Ginny Kroll uh, with Hortonworks, uh, previously with Microsoft as well, for about 13 years before joining Hortonworks in January. And I am the Global Alliance Marketing Manager, focusing on our Microsoft relationship. Awesome. So, uh, you know, in today's session, um, as the title suggests, our main focus would be looking at uh, some of the key scenarios around big data that we see often and how we can implement that on HD Insight in particular, uh, and but also in, in on the Hadoop uh, platform in general. Now, uh, one of the requirements, so it's a hands-on oriented session. So one of the requirement is that you have an environment where you can do the hands-on. Uh, so one of the very convenient uh, environment is the Hortonworks Sandbox. Uh, now, everything that we do on Hortonworks Sandbox, you can do it on HDP on Azure or HD Insight. And we are going to talk about those options more in detail. But straight out of the gate, if you don't have the Hortonworks Sandbox environment set up on Azure, so this would be a good time to kind of set it up. Uh, if you go to hortonworks.com slash sandbox and scroll down, there you'll have the link and the instructions on how to do it um, on setup um, for setting up the Hortonworks sandbox on Azure. And coming from our polling results, it looks like about 50% of people are saying that they have it installed currently. Okay, awesome, awesome. So for uh, the other 50 uh, who haven't, uh, please uh, go ahead and do so. It will take about... I would say uh, 10 to 15 minutes. It might go sooner in my experience recently. It's uh, really sped up recently. Uh, so that way we will be ready by the time I'm finished with my presentation part of it, you'll be ready with the environment and, uh, and move along. So the next section, next thing that you need are the instructions for the hands-on lab, obviously. So uh, we have put it up on this link again. So if you go to this link, uh, it's a Word document. So obviously you need uh, Microsoft Word to open it. Or if you don't have Microsoft Word, at least get Microsoft Word Viewer and that should be able to open it as well. Now, um, in that document, let me actually quickly switch over the document and show you some key things which uh, you might be able to get done while I'm uh, going through the presentation and that will speed up uh, and the lab that we get into after the presentation part of it. Um, so let me, here's the document here. So the first part of the document, as you see, is the prerequisite, right? So as the title suggests, again, um, what we are going to do is we are going to ingest uh, tweets from Twitter, right? So to be able to do that, you need a Twitter API key. So in the document, you'll see there's a link. And in that link, you'll have instructions how to get a Twitter API key if you don't have one. Uh, and, and the other thing is once you set up the sandbox, it should look something like this. Uh, it should look something like this, right? So uh, you'll have an IP address for your sandbox and which you can get from the Azure portal. So in my case, here I have set up my uh, virtual machine, which is uh, the Hortonworks sandbox. And when I click on it, I see the IP address. And um, I can copy this IP address here. I can copy it here. And when I go to uh, the port 8888, I see this screen. You might not see the bottom part of it. You have to click this uh, big orange button, closed ad or open advanced options in your case to see all these details. Uh, and from there, you'll see a link here, which which will give uh, let you kind of SSH in. Uh, so um, here, if, you, if I click on that, 
uh, I get a screen like this and then I can log in. So one of the things to remember while setting up your Azure Sandbox is the username password that you give while setting it up. It's very important to you know, note it down uh, because I have uh, done similar sessions before where attendees um, promptly forget the <laughs> username password and obviously you need that username password to log in. So make sure you uh, note it down. Now, uh, let me get back uh, to the uh, instructions here, a few of the other things. So once you kind of SSH in, by the way, uh, if you are on Windows and if you want to SSH in from an external client, another great external client is Putty. So you can download Putty from putty.org. And again, you can use that. Uh, to SSH in, but uh, in my opinion, uh, the built-in SSH client, web-based SSH client is convenient enough for today's lab. Okay, let me point out some of the other parts of the uh, uh, instructions which you can do in parallel as I get into the presentation part of it. So the next section is uh, setting or resetting the Ambari admin password. Now, this is important to do uh, because we want um, all users to have unique passwords for Ambari because if we kind of uh, preset a password, it will quickly get hacked, especially if it's on the cloud. So you would want to kind of reset this password and restart Ambari. So that way you can get access to Ambari following this instruction. And then there is this little script uh, that you uh, run from the SSH prompt, which will optimize the memory configuration on your sandbox. Uh, remember, I keep referring um, to the sandbox. Sandbox is essentially a one node cluster uh, running on a single VM so that it, it's not using a lot of resources on Azure. So it's uh, uh, pretty lightweight that way. and. Uh, but you'll have to have the right settings for your memory for the various services running on that sandbox so that it kind of uh, the lab goes smoothly. So uh, running this uh, script uh, will make sure you have the right configuration. And this going through the script or the script roughly takes almost about 10 to 12 minutes to run. So you want to kind of get it started so that by the time I finish the presentation part of it, we can move on to the more interesting parts of this lab. Now with that, uh, getting back to the presentation, uh, do we have any, uh, any questions in the meantime about the setup or the prerequisite part of it while we switch to the... No. Okay, cool. Questions. Huh? And we do have 100% of attendees saying that they have experience with Hadoop already. Awesome. So that's that's uh, that will make the labs go smoother. Perfect. <laughs> so uh, in case you didn't know, so since all of you have used Hadoop, I think you know about us, but a little bit uh, in case you don't. Uh, so we are a 100% open source company. So every line of code that we write or develop, uh, we put it out in the open source and um, uh, that is by design. Um, we want the collaboration and the contribution from everyone, including your company, including people like Microsoft, Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, and, and, and work with them to accelerate all these projects that we are working on. Um, we were founded a few years back in 2011. We were actually uh, carved out of Yahoo. So this is the team in Yahoo which created Hadoop in the first place. And at some point Yahoo uh, recognized that it can be a whole separate business. So they spun, in, spun us off as a separate company and became one of the investors. Also, we, have, uh, we still have great relationship with them. We kind of... Uh, um, uh, they provide one of the largest uh, clusters uh, that we run for testing our uh, code. 
Um, so we have close to 1,000 employees now, uh, close to 2,000 technology pa partners. We are in 17 countries. We are one of the uh, companies fastest to reach 100 million in revenue. And um, last but not the least, we are a uh, you know publicly traded company. So um, uh, so with that, a lot of uh, transparency comes into play. So you can look at you know um, what our plans are and things like that. So which our customers really like. So with that, uh, let's get into a little bit about the. You know why do we need Hadoop and all these different components, and what's what are the key drivers, uh, which is driving the evolution and revolution on this platform? So you, you would have heard uh, about this term IoT, right? Internet of Things. So Internet of Things, um, in very simple terms, means that you have a lot of endpoints, and these endpoints could be uh, mobile phones in your pockets it could be sensors on the ocean floors it could be bus and trucks running around in the cities it could be uh, you know shoes you are walking on means everything is connected these days and all of this is creating tremendous amount of data and um, organizations have realized that there's a lot of value in this data before this data used to be treated just as exhaust data, almost thrown away, it means uh, growing up <laughs> uh, in, in the companies I worked in early in my career, we used to have a person whose whole job used to be to truncate logs, right? And so that they can, it doesn't fill up the disk and so that they can get rid of the logs. But now we have realized that there's a lot of value in this data and uh, storage space has plummeted, the compute capacities have dramatically increased so we can make sense out of this data. Now, one of the things uh, that we have to keep in, in, keep, uh, in mind around this data is that because this data is being generated at such a phenomenal rate, we need to be able to, uh, you know, be manage the ingest of this data and and as well as store and process. So that's where our two lines of products that we have, HDF, which is the Hortonworks data flow, and HDP, which is the Hortonworks data platform, comes into play, right? So we have um, HDF which uh, is designed to deal with the data in motion. And then HDP, uh, where, uh, you know, uh, traditionally Hadoop played, uh, uh, addresses the data at rest, right? So once the data arrives, how do you uh, process it? How do you make sense out of it? Of it? How do you extract the intelligence out of it, right? Now, here are some of the very common use cases. Uh, you have real-time service cyber security um, and they are and they care about um, protecting systems like uh, routers or other systems or or they want to do threat detection there are smart manufacturing uh, who wants to uh, improve the yields uh, connected and autonomous cars obviously there's they are in a lot of news these days um, uh, you know, we hear that, you know, autonomous cars are getting smarter and smarter pretty much every week as they drive, as people use them and drive them around in the cities. Uh, all that information and data is being collected back and analyzed and that's making the cars just smarter. Uh, in a future farming means even uh, at home I have this little sensors which automatically turn uh, on my sprinklers depending on the moisture level uh, in the ground so things like that but even at a larger scale for farming um, there are many other uh, sensors which can be used like uh, the alkalinity or the acidity in the soil right and 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 many such uh, data can be consumed and um, uh, be used to uh, better the yields of farming. Of course, all of us have used 
uh, recommendation engines. Uh, anytime we go to Amazon or Netflix or you name it, uh, we or even do search on Bing or Google, uh, we are uh, being uh, kind of using various types of recommendation engine, which is throwing us results which uh, we, we care about. Now, all this kind of scenarios can be supported by platforms which addresses both data in motion and data at rest. And uh, uh, from Hortonworks, we provide you all the components required to address all these various scenarios. Now, let's kind of uh, dive, uh, dive in a little bit into uh, uh, the newer scenario, which is data in motion, right? So traditionally, when we think about data in motion, we think that we only ingest data. That is, data is just flowing in, and uh, which is not always the case. I'll give you an example. Uh, I used to work with uh, on a project with uh, United States Geological Survey, and uh, they had this uh, little sensors that they give out uh, to many homes in California. And these sensors uh, are of the size of a cigarette pack, and they would strap on a pole, something you know, uh, stable in their garages and things like that. And that would pick up very, uh, even faint seismic uh, data or you know, vibrations from the ground and send it back to a central server for analysis, right? Uh, and their whole goal was to be able to predict uh, you know, seismic activity, big seismic activity, right? But soon they find out once they started this pilot was uh, they were getting a lot of false alerts because as trucks were rolling by uh, during commute hours or whatnot, they would get this false alerts as if there's a, you know, it's an incoming uh, earthquake. So they had to send back, so they had a machine learning model which learned about or which predicted the thresholds, right thresholds to use at various points in time and send that data back into the sensors themselves so that they didn't trigger local alarms or false alarms, right? So data needs to flow in a bi-directional way. Uh, you, and across various kind of networks. At that time, it was several years back, uh, they used the GPRS networks. They didn't have high speed uh, 3G or 4G network to send this data in. They used, uh, you know, super low-tech GPRS networks to send this data in. So, uh, so you, you can imagine as we have all these sensors and endpoints and, um, you know, edge processing um, units uh, thrown around all over the world, we cannot be assured of the bandwidth, about the latency, about uh, intermittent connectivity and things like that. So we need uh, data flow infrastructure, which can deal with all of this. And HDF is designed to, uh, to, to be able to do that. So to go a little bit, uh, you know, more in more details as to what HDF was designed for. Uh, and, and before I go into it, let me give you a little bit of the history. Now, HDF is also commonly known as Apache NiFi. And uh, the word NiFi, if you expand it out, it means Niagara Files. So this was a technology which was developed at NSA, uh, National Security Agency, and they have been using it for close to eight or nine years. So it's a, uh, although it's a new thing to the enterprise or newer technology to the enterprise, but uh, NSA has been using it for uh, several years, so it's uh, it's very mature. So the where it came from was they wanted to uh, map out various data flows across all their organizations, and they're a, a very big organization, and they have various um, uh, you know, rules and regulations that they need to abide by, right? So uh, they obviously don't want to be in possession of data that they are not legally allowed to. So they 
have to make sure that they can filter out those data irrespective of where it is and and they want to also make sure that uh, this sensitive data are not being accessed by inadvertently or maliciously being accessed by people who shouldn't be accessing and things like that right so it was very difficult for them uh, to be able to uh, deal with this complexity of data flow uh, without a better system. So they started off mapping all this out on a visual worksheet. And soon the visual worksheet got very complex. And of course, the visual worksheet had no connect direct connectivity to the actual implementation, right? In a week, the visual worksheet would go obsolete and it no longer reflected the reality. Uh, so they developed this technology where um, it looked like a visual worksheet, but they can actually command and control the workflow and look at the audit and the provenance of the data uh, from this uh, UI. So it's a very visual user. It has a very visual user interface and it provides uh, immediate feedback. So if you think that something that's a data flow needs to be tweaked, uh, you need to be able to tweak it then and there without having to stop uh, the, all the service and, uh, and so on and, and change the data flow right there and see the results and even um, uh, simulate data flows and see, uh, you know, for historic data flows, you want to change certain values and see how it flows now and things like that. It needs to be adaptive to volume and bandwidth. For example, in any kind of data flow, a very common um, problem is back pressure, right? So you have a certain processing capacity, but when the data coming in is at a larger rate, then you can process it the queue gets longer and longer so the back pressure builds up at that point you need to be able to automatically decide by through rules and uh, you know thresholds as to what you want to do about it you can you know skip to the latest data or you can um, uh, signal to uh, you know the sender of the data saying hey stop slow down you know i can't um, process so much data and things like that so all these kind of capabilities are built in and and uh, i talked about provenance a little bit now the word provenance is kind of newer in the technology world but it's a very common word if you in the art world for example so if you uh, buy a, say a van gogh uh, you, you would want to know what's the provenance of this piece of art. Uh, what that means is that not only when and where uh, the artist created this piece of art, but who owned, was it restored, who even touched, where was it displayed. So all that uh, data, all that information is very, very important. And that's the same uh, with uh, data, right? Uh, you, you need to be able to know all that. And last but not the least, secure data acquisition and transport means security is paramount in this world. Um, and uh, and uh, again, Apache NiFi has been designed ground up for that. So with that, are there any questions around uh, NiFi, Ginny? No, so not currently. I think uh, most of our questions were around how do they install Sandbox? Where okay. do they get it from and the um, initial information that you shared in okay. terms of the Word doc. But I think we have now responded to all those questions. Sure. And so the answers are out there in the okay. question window for them. Awesome. OK. So uh, with that, let me move over to the next section, which is the uh, HTTP, uh, which handles data at rest. Now, again, a little bit history about Hadoop, right? Most of you know about it, but Hadoop was designed as a platform for um, uh, processing a lot of data in a batch mode pretty inexpensively. Uh, so it uh, stemmed from uh, this whole project, the Hadoop project stemmed from a paper that um, Google wrote around, uh, around MapReduce and uh, Google file system, right? Which is a distributed file system. 
Now, obviously, like Google, Yahoo, Microsoft, and many other internet companies, they had the same requirements. Uh, they needed to process a lot of data. Uh, in some in some cases, they wanted to build search indexes uh, relatively inexpensively. If they had to use you know, uh, very expensive hardware, uh, they couldn't kind of keep up with the cost. Neither could they scale, means the amount of data that they needed to process just were not suitable for uh, you know, traditional proprietary data platforms available at that time. So um, that's where this project came from. So uh, MapReduce and HDFS were the first generation of Hadoop. But soon, um, as enterprises started adopting um, uh, Hadoop platform for various other needs, people started building and demanding other capabilities. Other capabilities like being able to do interactive query over this platform means it's great that we have a distributed storage where we can store, you know, not just terabytes of data, but petabytes of data. That's great. But I want to run interactive queries, right? I want to do machine learning. Uh, I want to do search. I want to do real time. Now, to be able to do that on the same platform, we needed a way to do more efficient resource management right and from the beginning of our company one of the visions was to build that uh, uh, almost the data operating system which we call yarn which provides this uh, resource management um, being able to securely uh, uh, apply policies around how those resources are allocated uh, support multi-tenancy and so on and as it became the data operating system supporting all these various workloads, uh, especially in the enterprise, uh, demanded a way to be able to govern all that data in a unified way, to be able to secure all this data in a unified way, to be able to manage it like you, you would manage other enterprise uh, infrastructure. And that's where we have invested a lot to make that possible. Uh, we, we will talk about various projects like, for example, around security, we uh, now have Apache Ranger um, and Apache Knox. Uh, Apache Ranger provides a granular security across all these workloads, whether you are trying to secure HBase or Hive or um, you know Solar, you can do it all from uh, Apache Ranger. Uh, 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 um, a gateway level security with Apache Knox, right? Uh, Ambari, which you will uh, soon see and use uh, in this in, in the labs, uh, provides you a unified way to manage, monitor, deploy uh, all these resources, uh, all all these uh, capabilities um, in in a unified way. Uh, we have Atlas and Falcon, which helps you do governance over data again irrespective of whatever your your application characteristics are uh, you can govern your data using uh, atlas and falcon and again uh, we also designed this whole platform for deployment choice so uh, hortonworks data platform lets you deploy um, Hadoop and the and the entire platform, not just on uh, where you'd expect, like you know, lin various versions of Linux like CentOS, Red Hat, SUSE, Ubuntu, but also Windows, also uh, AWS, Azure, um, uh, Google Cloud, you, you name it. So right, uh, but of course today we are going to specifically look at. Um, you know, the, the awesome integration we have with Azure. Now, uh, uh, you, you've heard of all these various projects, right? All these various projects uh, serve various purposes uh, which traditional enterprise applications require. It's not necessary that you use all these different projects in a single application. 
but you have it's it's like a you know a buffet right you pick and choose what you want to have uh, depending on what your scenarios and your requirements are now what we do is uh, we provide a supported uh, package and distribution of all these various projects so that you know that once you get this uh, distribution from Hortonworks, all these various pieces are tested to work with each other. And to back it up, we also provide, Hortonworks provides the support required uh, to make sure um, in case you have any questions or if you have any issues or even need guidance, uh, we are there to help. And, and it, uh, the same holds for uh, the Microsoft offerings. Uh, so we worked with Microsoft uh, almost since the inception of our company very closely with their engineering to make sure HD Insight is built on HDP. So uh, uh, the, we can provide the same level of support with HD Insight as well. Now, uh, as I mentioned, of course, uh, Hortonworks Data Platform and HD, HDF are you know, uh, based on open source projects, but we do a lot of the heavy lifting in the community. Uh, we shepherd the community, we do a bulk of uh, the development. We have the most committers across any of the Hadoop companies, uh, right? So we kind of influence the roadmaps. Uh, so the, uh, often the customers that we work with uh, provide a lot of the requirements into what goes into the roadmap for uh, uh, both Hadoop and Apache NiFi, right? Now coming to a little bit about uh, what are the various options on Azure? So obviously you can uh, deploy uh, Hadoop on-prem, whether it's on Linux or on Windows, uh, that's HDP. Uh, you can uh, implement uh, HDP on an appliance. Uh, most of the appliance vendors already um, uh, distribute HDP as the standard version of Hadoop uh, with their appliance. But on the cloud side also, uh, we provide uh, uh, HDP as an IaaS offering. For example, uh, we have um, uh, HDP on Azure, which is an IaaS offering. But we also provide Hadoop as a service offering like Microsoft HD Insight. You can also deploy um, Hadoop on a virtualized uh, environment like VMware, Docker, OpenStack, and we support all of those. Um, any questions so far? No, I think we're good. Coming specifically to Azure, here are some of the options. Uh, hopefully by now all of you have experienced HDP Sandbox in the marketplace, Azure marketplace. So as we mentioned, it's a single node. It's great for uh, you know learning, developing, uh, prototyping and so on. It's a full, fully functional HTTP cluster, which uses very little resource, uh, Azure resource. Uh, by the way, you can also download the VM from Hortonworks website on your local machine if you need to, but most people prefer it to just uh, run it on Azure. It's very convenient. Um, and then, of course, uh, we have uh, HTTP Azure on IaaS, which is, which people typically use for production um, or even you know the next level of prototyping where you actually have multi-node cluster on Azure which uh, resembles much more closely what you would see in production um, and uh, uh, you know it can connect to blob storage uh, and you get all the benefits of uh, as that you'd get r running HDP on-prem. So a lot of our customers who use, who already run HDP on-prem, if they want the identical environment on Azure, uh, this would be the way to go, right? The third option is HD Insight, which is, as we uh, 
already mentioned is a pass offering a platform as a service offering right but it has the same bits as HTTP. so if you have an application which works on HTTP, it's pretty much certain to work on HD Insight, but it makes it even simpler to scale, to deploy, to manage on Azure. It has the ad additional benefit of Microsoft doing that level of engineering and aut automation to integrate with, say, uh, Blob Store as well as Azure Data Lake. So uh, these are some of the uh, benefits of HD Insight. And last but not the least, we have a um, uh, uh, um, means of deploying uh, HDP on any cloud of your choice, including Azure, right? Uh, you can, um, uh, it's called CloudBreak. You can access it from launch.hortonworks.com and you can uh, deploy Hadoop on any cloud platform of your choice, right? Now let's get into a little bit uh, into some of the common use cases, right? So uh, why do people use our Hadoop, right? The, one of the most common uses of Hadoop is um, archive. Uh, so data of uh, enterprise data warehouse. Typically enterprise data warehouse uh, platform um, uh, or, or the demand on enterprise data warehouse is increasing at a tremendous rate. People, uh, so IT departments are being asked to put more and more data on enterprise data warehouses. And it becomes very expensive, very fast, and it's very hard to grow that, right, organically. But Hadoop is a platform which provides a lot of those benefits without that level of the cost. So, um, so you can have your really hot data uh, in the in enterprise data warehouse, and then you can, uh, you know, archive off uh, your slightly older data, which you don't need to access that often, um, into onto the Hadoop platform. But many of the features that you get from your uh, uh, appliance, uh, EDW appliance, you still get from. Hadoop and most of the appliance vendors are building that integration, really uh, uh, putting a lot of work into that so that it's very seamless, right? Uh, one example is Microsoft's Polybase, right? Microsoft Polybase lets you run T-SQL query uh, across data sitting on your appliance and your um, uh, and the Hadoop uh, platform, right? So that's just one of the examples. Um, so uh, the next example is onboarding costly ETL process. Now we have had ETL platforms for a long time, right? Um, and one of the constraints as the data volume increased was that most of the ET ETL platform was not distributed. It, it, and Hadoop provides a great, great scale out inexpensive or relatively inexpensive uh, ETL platform where you can uh, scale out as much as you want based on your data volume. So that's again a very, very common use case. The third use case is enriching the value of your enterprise data warehouse, right? So you, ha you have to deal with this new kinds of data which you traditionally didn't have to deal with uh, in your enterprise data warehouse like log data. Uh, and all, the, all that data can land straight into the Hadoop platform and then you can combine the data, your traditional structured data, which is sitting in your enterprise data uh, warehouse uh, with the uh, so-called unstructured or semi-structured data sitting in the uh, enterprise data warehouse and uh, gain uh, better insights. Uh, here is an example, uh, one of our uh, customers, uh, they uh, started with uh, just uh, six nodes um, and rapidly grew, grew to 60 nodes, uh, two petabytes of data in under a year. So their storage costs before and after HDP is $19 per gigabytes to 12 cents per gigabyte, right? Um, so they actually, their um, uh, executives mentioned 
the HTTP platform as one of the key things which enabled them to do their IPO in such a short time. We actually have videos and so on, on on this use case and many other use cases. Uh, it's all available on hortonworks.com website. Go look that up uh, and you'll find it fascinating. Now talking about uh, Apache NiFi or Hortonworks data flow use cases, um, some of the very common use cases are predictive analytics. Uh, again, I, I was talking about that USGS web uh, use case, right? Where you have this model which is generating the threshold values which needs to flow back to the uh, edge points uh, where the alerts are being thrown, right? So those kind of use cases um, can be very well be addressed by Apache NiFi, right? So hand in hand with predictive analytics for compliance. So for full transparency, transparency into provenance and flow of data, which system changed the data, which user touched which data. So all that uh, uh, provenance is stored uh, and accessible through Apache NiFi. IoT optimization, like securing, prioritizing, and enriching um, uh, the, the various data events that's flowing through. All data are not created equal. You want to prioritize flow of and processing of certain kinds of data and event uh, over others. And again, that's very much po possible with the Apache NiFi platform. Fraud detection. Um, uh, again, uh, this is a very common use cases use case in uh, insurance and other financial services uh, industries. A big data ingest, right? Uh, so, <laughs> as talking with one of our um, um, you know consulting guys, and he says, you know, uh, before HDF, 80% of his time was spent into figuring out how to get the data into the Hadoop platform. Once it was on the Hadoop platform. It's relatively easy to you know, extract insight from it, but just to get all this data from all the systems uh, flowing into very uh, flowing in various rates, how to get that in? So again, Apache NiFi squarely addresses those kind of use cases, right? Um, and of course, value resources. Uh, as data kind of flows in and you store, you are utilizing resources to be able to do that. And often you want to know what's the value of these various types of data and how you should uh, prioritize your investment um, on, on these various types of data. Um, and uh, you, you use Apache NiFi to, do them, to be able to do that. Uh, last but not least, a very common use case is uh, log optimization, often terms in conjunction with uh, Splunk. Now Splunk is a great platform for doing lo log analytics, but the cost of using Splunk uh, very quickly um, increases to you know, dramatic levels uh, as the data size increases, obviously. And that's where HDP can complement that and HDF can let you prioritize what, what data goes into Splunk and what data goes into HDP for analytics, right? And that Many of our customers use this kind of scenario uh, to uh, dramatically um, cut down their Splunk licensing cost. So um, again, um, you know, diving in a little bit on Yarn, and I, I mentioned some of this already before, so I'm going to go quickly over this. Um, uh, so, you know, we started with Hadoop, with MapReduce, but we have come far. It, be, it has become a platform which can support various workloads, provide all the enterprise capabilities like security, gov governance, um, manageability, and so on. So, and Yarn is the kind of the epicenter uh, of this, uh, or, uh, you know, uh, of this platform which enables all this. So it uh, enables multi-tenancy, better utilization, uh, uh, you know, uh, integration with other vendors. Uh, just to prove this, means uh, uh, when I was at Microsoft, I was in the 
uh, Windows HPC team and we used to try to get customers to adopt really large clusters so that obviously we can uh, you know claim that as evidence that our software can run on a uh, large cluster but oftentimes after customer bought a large cluster uh, we went back after a month uh, back and they would carve out this large cluster into really small clusters let's say they bought a hundred node cluster they would break it down into 10 10 node clusters uh, based on the various departments that kind of contributed money for that cluster because everyone demanded a different sla and for the it department for to address that SLA, there was no unified way at that time to be able to do that now yarn uh, straight out of the gate addresses that you can have various policies which assures those SLAs for those various departments um, yeah, without having to break down that cluster into mini clusters right so you know uh, um, Yahoo uses more than 40,000 nodes uh, very very large organizations like Spotify progressive Coles, sprint uh, pretty much all the telecoms uh, in North America are our customers. Um, close to 70% of the retailers are our customers. Uh, they all run uh, big clusters and they don't have to break it down into smaller uh, clusters to address uh, uh, various use cases and uh, department SLAs. So, uh, so to kind of uh, flesh it out a little bit more, so for each one of these boxes that we were discussing, like uh, governance, uh, integration, um, we have Falcon and Atlas. Uh, uh, you know, for data workflow, we have uh, Scoop, Loom, Kafka, NFS, and so on. So these are all the technologies that we are investing in, which are supporting these various uh, uh, so to say, uh, use cases, enterprise use cases. I'm going a little quicker on these slides because I want to really get to the hands-on section. So if you have question or want me to dive in, in a certain area, please feel free to use the Q&A tool to again, uh, let me know where you want more information. Now, uh, talking about uh, the Ambari interface. Now, if you have already um, uh, installed the Hortonworks Sandbox, uh, you can actually uh, see the Ambari interface in action. Let me actually show you here. Instead of showing you a screenshot, it's much more exciting to see uh, the actual uh, thing in working. So Ambari is here. So hopefully you have set uh, your unique username password or at least password and logged into Ambari. Now, once you log into Ambari, uh, you'll see all these various uh, services, right? That make up the HTTP platform. And you can pick and choose what you want installed. For example, by default, in uh, NiFi is uh, not deployed on the sandbox. So how you would install uh, NiFi or deploy NiFi is go here into actions. Uh, I have to scroll down and say add service and I have already added mine so it's uh, it's uh, that's why it's pre-checked but you check this and go next 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 pick all the default values and you should have NiFi running now once you have NiFi running you can look at the configurations from here uh, for example, if you uh, didn't know which port NiFi was running, for example, so you can uh, look at, uh, I believe, uh, here. Uh, yeah. So NiFi port 9090. And then if you go to uh, your IP address, as uh, uh, you see on the Azure portal and port uh, 9090, you should see the NiFi UI, which kind of looks like a blank visual sheet or uh, worksheet, uh, and it's by design. Um, so going back to Ambari, uh, you can also um, uh, do things like you can 
uh, remember we changed some of the yarn and these configurations you would actually see that uh, you know um, we have changed this about 12 hours back so it actually gives versions of the uh, configurations and it shows you which con uh, which uh, components needs to be restarted you, it gives you a way to kind of in a very user friendly way to configure this um, and uh, you, you can also get to um, other UIs like resource manager UI to see what jobs are running and so on now there's a lot to be covered obviously we won't be getting into we can't even cover ambari end to end in this uh, little session <laughs> you'd have to take a you know four day training uh, from hortonworks to get to all that but um, uh, even before that we have a great set of tutorials so if you go to hortonworks.com tutorials it walks through a lot of this so uh, that's a great place to start um, Okay, uh, another thing I wanted to quickly show at this point was the various, uh, what we call the views, right? So for example, HDFS view, right? So it lets you see the HDFS files here. Uh, it's almost like a file browser. Uh, you can look at the, uh, you know, various files uh, and so on, right? and you can upload files from here so this is the hdfs files view uh, from hive view you can run hive queries um, you can also obviously run hive queries from command line or from your application through using the api um, or from uh, any odbc client uh, like excel uh, so but you, th this is a convenient place if you want to quickly um, uh, try out some Hive queries and so on. Okay, so let's uh, go back to the slide deck and finish the rest of the pieces before we jump into the um, the lab bar section. So. Uh, let's look at how a typical streaming application looks like what are the components right so on the left hand side you have basically the endpoints which generate all these logs and then um, you, you can have hdf capture all those logs um, do a simple event processing um, you know shuttle this events and data into various subsystem of hadoop uh, for various kind of processing and then of course you have all these different components of hadoop and finally you want to um, uh, throw alerts or do other kind of kinds of things right so uh, this is a very simplistic kind of architecture diagram um, a, a common way to think about it is uh, often called a lambda architecture um, so lambda architecture uh, is a is breaks down all the various components into three layers the batch layer the serving layer and the speed layer so uh, uh, typically the speed layer is where the data um, is landing uh, into um, and uh, it kind of process it in the data in real time and updates the various views in the serving layer and serving layer is where you are um, the end user or a data scientist or data analyst is consuming uh, the insights from but uh, the data is also uh, uh, landing into the what we call the item potent store basically the store where uh, once the data lands it doesn't change and doesn't and, and the reason you don't want to change the data is because you can rebuild the all the business views from scratch anytime you want from the raw data right um, and and uh, that's at a very high level what um, lambda architecture is there's a lot of uh, material on lambda architecture uh, and I'll um, kind of uh, 
if you have any questions, please ask me, or I'll kind of encourage you to look up uh, Lambda architecture. Right? Now, here is a little bit more detailed uh, architecture diagram of how the data flows. As you see, the data is typically uh, ingested into HDF. And now HDF in turn can put it on a message bus like Kafka, uh, and then uh, various things uh, can be there like uh, 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 consumers, like you can uh, uh, put it on Storm for complex event processing or Spark for complex event pro uh, or micro batch processing. You can, um, uh, you know, storing the data into HDFS, which in turn you can again consume from Spark streaming. Um, and then you can um, uh, land it on a Hive server for reporting, or you can do uh, using a Spark Thrift server, you can do interactive queries on, on this uh, streaming data set. You can use Spark ML for machine learning, uh, uh, or you can from here, from Storm, you can land it in HBase for doing massive queries or dashboarding. Uh, now HBase is very, very, capable uh, of doing um, you know, sub-second queries where you have a flat table of uh, millions of columns and billions of rows, uh, you know, even very, very large internet properties like Facebook uses HBase to really, really scale uh, those queries. Or you can uh, push it out uh, as alerts over you know, JMS and things like that, right? So this is kind of a more detailed architecture um, uh, of what we saw in a previous few slides, but let's see and get it working uh, uh, on the Hortonbox sandbox. Any questions so far, any problems you faced so far um, on uh, following uh, the prerequisites uh, for the uh, lab? So I'm guessing you have finished up till this point at least. And then you have also finished uh, adding NIFI, which I have had done last night uh, for myself. Um, so that's why I have uh, NIFI installed. A way to test that your NIFI uh, is configured and working is uh, obviously to go to this uh, particular port uh, on your IP address. And again, to remind you, you can look at the, look up your IP address here. Once your uh, VM is uh, installed, it should uh, give you the public IP address. So look up this IP address and then go to port 1990 slash NIFI. You'll see this blank uh, worksheet. Okay. And let's go back to the instructions. Uh, so the next part is to uh, very quickly uh, uh, configure solar. Now uh, to configure solar, just let me see one if I, there's a inst any instruction I missed here. Looks like not. Um, uh, now solar comes with a dashboard technology called Banana. So the easiest way to kind of configure that banana dashboard uh, that we will use is just uh, download it. So I'll go to the uh, shell. Actually, let me uh, put it side by side so that you know what instruction I'm kind of following and where I'm uh, using it. Uh, so uh, I often like the uh, shell prompt that comes with uh, Mac. If you have the bash subsystem or the Ubuntu subsystem that recently was announced with uh, Windows, you might also get this uh, so uh, SSH command line, or you can always use Putty, right? So uh, at, I'll put this IP address here. Copy paste is always kind of copy. There you go. 
let me actually also dock this here on this side so i'll paste this take out the http part of it So in this case, the subtuck part is my username that I had provided while deploying the sandbox. And, and then this is the public IP which Azure gave me. And I say yes. And then I put in the password. So this is where uh, you put the password that you kind of. So now I'm uh, logged in. Now once I'm logged in, I can. Um, go become uh, promote myself as a root so you see the instruction here so sudo su hyphen and i'll have to again put my password for my user so now i'm root and i cdm in the root uh, Okay, now at this point, I, I can run this bash script. I can set the admin password and so on. I, I'm guessing you have already done that. Uh, I can also uh, download this uh, dashboard. So I copy, paste. Okay, so, and I also download the solar configuration. Now I've got both of those. Now the next step is very, very important. Now there is a, the Java home on sandbox is incorrectly set. So it's very important that you actually set the Java home correctly. So this line will uh, help you do that. Uh, so the export command. So at this point, your Java home should be set correctly. Um, and then uh, some of uh, the attendees in past sessions, they uh, often get it malformed and then none of the other things work anymore. So uh, be very careful about this part of it. And at this point, you should be able to start um, uh, solar. So it says started solar on port 8983. Eight, Happy searching, so yeah, happy indeed. And at this point, I can create uh, some topics on solar. So, it looks like we have a quick question coming in. Yeah. It says, I'm not finished adding NiFi. I don't see the actions add service option at the bottom of the panel to the left. I log into public IP. Okay, so oh, as Maria Dev, so yeah, so the question was, hey, when I log in as a user, Maria underscore Dev, why do I don't, why do I not see the ad uh, service? And it's by design, the Maria Dev user is just a viewer, so to say. You can see what's going on in Ambari, but you are not an admin, so you can't change anything. So you would have to, uh, you know, here, if you go up into this instruction, uh, here you log into the shell prom or secure shell SSH and set the admin password. And then you'll have to log into Ambari using admin as the user and the password that you just set as Ambari admin password. So when you run this script, it will ask, for, ask you for a new password and that's the password you need to use to log in. And once you log in as an admin on the admin on Ambari, uh, then you'll see the ad service. So hopefully that kind of addresses uh, the issue you are facing. Uh, let me know if it doesn't, it should. Okay. So moving on, um, 
so uh, I'll create the uh, you know the solar collection for the tweets. So at this point, what I want to do is uh, get the NiFi template, right? So NiFi template, uh, here is what you can do. You can copy this, and basically you want to kind of save it as a XML file into your uh, guest operating system. So if I go here and uh, paste this, paste and go. So this is the XML file I want to, Say I want to save. Let me do one thing. Uh, let me actually uh, uh, save it from command line. Uh, you can also essentially use wgate or any other way you want to download this file onto your local system. Uh, so I'll, I, I can open a new tab in shell, new tab, and I can um, go to my downloads directory downloads and i can say wget and that url that i had paste so now i have this xml file in my downloads directory now if you have a uh, nifi already set up what you can do here is um, you can go to nifi you can go here NIFI templates, you can you see it's kind of empty. I can browse and I can um, uh, basically pick this up because I ha already had um, a Twitter dashboard.xml. That's why it's kind of, uh, you know, give saved it as dot point one. So just be careful what name it's being saved as. Let me see if it works this way. And say import. So yeah, so it doesn't matter what the extension is, it imports correctly. So it should show up like this, right? Now, uh, before I go any further, here is the thing about this. So in Dataflow, you have all these processors. So the key thing that you need to think in terms of is this processors. Now, this processors uh, lets you do various things. For example, uh, it lets you read from the file system, right? So if I search for file, uh, it will say get file. So this is one of the processors. So if I say add, it will put this on this, you know, blank visuals sheet. Now, if I say configure, you'll see all the properties as to what's the input directory, uh, what I, what kind of files I want and things like that. Now let's say I say, okay, slash TMP is my, is my directory that I want to read from. I'm just kind of showing you how to use, uh, uh, NIFI before getting into a much more complex uh, data flow, which we will use soon enough. Uh, and then I want, where do I want, once this processor reads the file, where do I want to send it to? Let's say I want to just store it on HDFS. So I come here again and say HDFS. Now we are uh, rapidly adding more and more processors. So if you, uh, um, this is not the latest and greatest version of Hortonworks Dataflow. If you install the latest version of Dataflow, you'll see a lot more processors. Also, you can build your own processors. So I say add here. And once I add here again, let's say I want, where do I want to, I can configure it like I configured. So uh, again, here it's important where in HDFS I want to store it. So again, let's say put it on temp on HDFS. So I apply this and then I can just connect these two. 
right? So on success on get file, it's going to uh, send it to the processor put HDFS, right? So at this point, you see this little red icons here, and this one still uh, is kind of, um, uh, you know, um, showing uh, uh, that I haven't done something. So I can go back and say, uh, okay, um, auto terminate uh, on um, failure or success, uh, or actually on failure uh, and success, let's say, yeah. So basically from here, I don't want to go anywhere else. Uh, it's it's the kind of the uh, end point or end of the flow. So at this point, if I click here and say play, it's going to start watching for files in the temp directory. And as I drop new files, it's going to put it into HDFS, right? So that's the simplest kind of data flow you can have. But let's say I want to kind of um, delete this, clean this up. Uh, okay. Uh, and clean this up. I want to just uh, look at the more complex data flow that we had, right? So I pull in this template icon and I see this Twitter dashboard, which we had imported and I say add. So I see one big processor. It looks like a processor, but it's a, what we call a group. If I double click on it, you'll see I have a much more complex uh, data flow. Now, I'd like to spend the rest of the time walking you through this flow so that you know what's going on, right? So um, first of all, here, the first processor is the get Twitter processor, and that's where we are going to use the credentials that we created, the keys and stuff like that, that we created uh, in our Twitter. Uh, so here I have created two apps. So I'm going to use this one here and it will have this um, uh, keys right here. And I'll go and say keys and access tokens. And um, here I have the consumer keys and then the access tokens. I'll need all of this and be very careful while copying this. You can, uh, you can uh, get errors. You don't copy these keys correctly, right? So be sure what you are selecting and copying. So copy this and then you go to NiFi, go to configure on this. Now all this is already given into your in the step by step guide. So for folks who are kind of uh, are in steps, previous steps, don't panic. You can just follow the steps and uh, you should be good. And if you get any issues, feel free to ask uh, and I'll be able to I should be able to answer. So here is my new key. And you see the consumer secret value is not set. And we do that on purpose. Even when we, when let's say I created this template and I export this template and send it to a colleague of mine to use, um, I don't want my keys to go along with it. He should be able to use his own key because keys are kind of uh, by the very nature of it personal. Uh, so you don't want to be a sharing your own keys across the organization. So uh, again, go back to NiFi, uh, copy the consumer secret up out here. Make sure you don't select the blanks or the spaces rather um, and go here, set the consumer secret key. Okay. And um, access token. Uh, again, here. And I go here, uh, access token. I delete this and paste my new one. And the access token secret. Copy. 
copy and uh, nifi and secret okay so at this point uh, this particular processor is ready to go so if i say apply you will see that this little icon changes from this uh, warning symbol the yellow triangle with the exclamation point to a uh, solid red uh, so and uh, one of the things to note in the properties is that terms to filter on so these are the terms from twitter that i am filtering on so it's going to basically get json um, call the twitter api and get json's of the tweets um, and uh, and flow it further down so i say apply so you see it's turned to solid red so if i select this one and play the uh, hit the play button only this will run none of the other ones uh, now but before i do that actually let me do that so that we know whether our uh, configuration is right or not if it doesn't read the tweets that means something's wrong but uh, hopefully uh, so you see uh, it's uh, reading uh, tweets but because none of it uh, the other processors are working uh, it's uh, uh, it's not uh, consuming this data that it's sending along let me actually start playing all of this and then keep on um, explaining what it does any questions in the meantime when while i'm doing this so as you can see, uh, this processor uh, put out about 18 tweets. Uh, this ingested the 18 tweets uh, and processed it. Now you can actually look at what it's uh, getting. Uh, so you say uh, data provenance here. So you see all this uh, tweets have come in. So you click here you can go to content you can go to view and you, if you uh, say formatted it's actually going to show you the uh, uh, the json format so you see the text of that tweet is linkedin appoints x dell ireland head to a new role so because we had put dell as one of our search terms uh, that's why it picked up this tweets right to tweet or tweet uh, as um, so looks like uh, uh, yeah trying to see any other useful information of course we know what time who, who's the id and so on so somebody called jeffrey uh, has is sending out this uh, looks like he's using a bot called linkedin autopilot he has actually uh, and Zapier to kind of uh, push out these tweets. So he's not tweeting by hand. So you can actually look at a lot of the data, uh, what's going on from this. But um, uh, you can close this and uh, let's see what's happening under in the next uh, section, right? So here, let's see what this guy is doing. So if I see view configuration on this, and go to again properties uh, here what i'm doing is i'm extracting the various uh, uh, properties in the json uh, segment as properties on the flow file now I, I use the term flow file what flow file means is basically it means a single event or a packet so on that packet you can put various properties it's like an envelope you can think of flow file as an envelope and on the envelope you have all these properties like name address blah 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 now of course it has some properties that comes by default but you can uh, put in defined properties like here we have for example language right we are pulling out the lang uh, attribute from the json uh, packet and assigning it to language the twitter handle uh, the twitter hashtags we are pulling it uh, all out from json right 
and assigning it to attributes. And um, and let's see uh, what's uh, going on here. Uh, let's uh, see the provenance on this one. So for it's a one-to-one -one mapping for every tweet that has been read. Uh, I have a, another flow file, but on this flow file, we will have um, some additional attributes. So here uh, we will have uh, additional attributes uh, for the uh, various attributes that we have uh, set. Only if I can find from this one. So. So yeah. So uh, so here here is the attributes actually. Uh, so here is the JSON file which is unchanged. But here is the Twitter dot message. Uh, here is the you know obviously time and ID and uh, you know the username and so on. Um, so why we are pulling out these attributes is down the line we will use some of these attributes to filter the tweets so in the next processor what we are doing is we only want uh, what we uh, the flow files that we read read from twitter which actually contains a message as you know there are a lot of bots on twitter which will put out tweets with blank messages right um, and uh, and uh, and we don't want those so here if you look at this um, we are actually uh, filtering on uh, the twitter dot message is empty not it's kind of a yoda style uh, of writing uh, twitter message is empty not uh, when it's not empty, then only then we want to kind of route it further uh, into the uh, solar content stream. So we are writing into solar here. And on the other hand, we are also, uh, you know, shunting it on this flow uh, where uh, we are doing some other things. Let me get into that. So here we are putting it on solar. Here we are processing it further we are replacing some text so we are changing the flow file into a pipe delimited uh, format and the reason we are changing it into a pipe delimited format is because then it cre it's easier to create a hive schema on a pipe delimited um, uh, on, on a set of files which are pipe pipe will pipe delimited, right? Uh, Let me interrupt with a quick question on some NiFi default settings here. It looks like they're having a challenge even after retrying. Uh, okay, uh, so what's the challenge? Customize add service wizard appears to hang. Cancel the win, retried, same result. Hmm, Eesh. well. It's hard for me to troubleshoot that one because I don't think I have enough information. But um, it appears to hang. And uh, I'm guessing you are still doing it on Sandbox. Uh, it did work for me last night. Uh, I don't know if uh, uh, some service configurations are not configured properly. Oh, let's see. I'm trying to think if I, in the customized service, did I change anything at all? Uh, 
yeah, I don't think I changed anything at all. So it, it should have, uh, okay, let me know if others are also having the same issue or is it kind of a, uh, you know, one off, um, you know, configuration issue. Uh, let me know if, if, if this issue is prevalent, then uh, we'll obviously need to do uh, look into it more. But if it's just a one off, uh, one, one way to do it is just, uh, I know it'll, it's time consuming, but uh, you know, blow off the uh, sandbox, recreate the sandbox, that way you get a, you know, uh, start from a known state. Um, uh, if I had direct access to that your box, I would have been able to help, but uh, it's hard for me to uh, troubleshoot that one. I apologize. Okay. Um, so uh, again, coming back to this one. So this one basically uh, is converting it into type delimited. So again, if I go to data provenance and look at the data itself, it should um, show up as... Uh, you tend to just mention the sandbox is running from Azure. Okay. Okay. So um, here, if I look at the output, I see it's it has been transformed into type... Uh, delimited okay um, so it's yeah okay so uh going back to the next step uh so this process of merge content is a very useful one so i'd love for you to kind of pay attention to this one so what it does is in any high throughput system one of one of the ways to get even higher throughput is to do what we call batching so what batching means is that you don't want to send out one event at a time if you can if you can uh, withstand or tolerate a little bit of latency you want to batch a bunch of events into one packet and hand it over to the process next processing engine that increases the throughput because uh, then the processor can process all those uh, uh, messages in one shot and not have to do it one by one, right? Uh, uh, so, uh, so here you see, if you look at it, uh, the input has been about 347 mass messages and output have been only 34, right? And the reason it's so because we are batching it here. So you'll see we are batching a minimum number of entries of 20 and, um, you know, and then handing it over to the next section, right? So, um, so that's why it's uh, doing that. Now, from here, we are uh, putting it in file that we are, st that is storing it in the file system. Uh, so in slash temp slash tweets. So if you go to slash temp slash tweets on your uh, on your uh, sandbox. So if you say ls slash temp slash tweets, you should see a bunch of files here. And this where ls if you do a ls minus l, then you should show the time when it kind of was generated so you can see it's uh, uh, pretty new it's uh, today 11th and um, yeah so it's uh, it's on a different time zone uh, I think it's on GMT so that's why it's uh, showing some time in 5 p.m. in the afternoon or something like that I can't count yeah it looks like it's 5 p.m. Yeah, so these are uh, the files. If you want to do see what one of those files look like, so you can always do this cat, copy this and say cat dot slash. Oh, okay, uh, not dot slash slash tmp 
I can't type today. So, tweets. So you can see these are the files uh, which has the uh, both the type limited delimited data and the JSON itself. Um, so okay, I do this, keep doing this on the plane, and <laughs> people freak out. So, um, so here, uh, this this one, this particular processor, put HDFS. Uh, it does uh, it does a similar thing. It puts it on HDFS, but it also um, is is uh, configured to handle failure. Typically, HDFS is a remote subsystem. It's not connected to the same box where HDFS, uh, you know, physically connected. So there might be network failure or whatnot. So what this connection says is that it's going to retry. So if you look at the view um, configuration, uh, uh, it it, uh, uh, it it will uh, retry, and we have number of retries. Um, configured and um, otherwise it will store it in the uh, slash temp slash tweet staging on HDFS. And the way it knows how to connect to a particular HDFS instance is by reading this core site.xml which you should get from your HDFS admin. Um, <coughs> so you can look at the prop view configuration on this one. And if you look at the settings, uh, you'll see whether it has any back pressures or not. Um, and it's, it's only when it's failing, will it be used and so on. So with that, let's go and see on, um, on uh, HDFS if our files are coming in. So we saw in slash TMP, slash twist staging. So again, you see all these files uh, have uh, been generated. Now at this point, uh, remember it was also going to solar here. So let's see if uh, anything landed on solar or not. So um, I'll go back to my instructions and um, way to and look up what's the port for the solar um, dashboard. Copy and four zero. This is my NIFI. Let's see if NIFI comes up. Or is it our? Okay. I might have given the wrong IP. First, let me paste this one, and then I'll go back and get my uh, IP for my uh, current cluster sandbox. Copy. Go back here. Put it back here. Put a colon here. And let's see if my dashboard comes up. So as you can see, it, it's uh, doing a real time or pretty real time uh, view of the word tag. So somebody called Trading Guru uh, is apparently very uh, doing a lot of tweets. Um, uh, I can bet it's a bot. That's why it's putting out so many. And because we have selected uh, stock names, that's why you see all the, in the word tag, all the trading guru, top tech stocks, you'd expect they would be uh, typically um, uh, tweeting more about stocks. Uh, so the top Twitter is trading guru, and I bet it's a bot app software because it's all software or IT related 
companies, uh, deals, uh, top tech stocks, and so on, right? So, and you can configure this. Uh, uh, you can configure this dashboard to your liking. You can change the uh, uh, change the search terms, obviously. And you saw how quickly we could create an end-to-end, um, you know, IoT solution uh, without writing a single line of code. Uh, and, it, and it's just amazing. And you can now uh, query the, the same data from Hive. If you go here are instructions for that um, on how to do that, uh, because it's also landing into Hive. And, um, and also, for example, if you run this query from um, uh, Ambari here, you go to Hive view. And you ran this. Uh, it, it will create a new um, uh, table uh, called tweets, and uh, then you'd be able to query it uh, from uh, uh, from Hive. You can connect uh, something like Zeppelin to it. Zeppelin is an interactive. Um, uh, a data science platform. Um, you can uh, look at it from Excel, you name it. So that's kind of uh, what the lab and the demo is. At this point, what we can do is we can um, answer any question Q&A, or if you guys are facing other issues or any questions, we can address that. Sounds good. Sounds good. So let me switch back and just show some of the resources, by the way. And you know, uh, Ginny, you can tell tell them well, more what talk they talk about resources. Perfect. Yeah. What what they get out of those uh, resources. So uh, Hortonworks has a very large training community as well as an interactive online community and the Hortonworks community based on our website. So if you go out to hortonworks.com, WAC training, you can see a whole bunch of the tutorials that Saptak mentioned earlier. Um, if you go out there to hortonworks.com, WAC community, there's actually um, a large community comprised of many, like I believe it's over 4,000 registered users out there, uh, people bringing their Hadoop questions um, as well as other Apache product questions to that community. Um, it's very open. A lot of our engineers participate there as well. So if you have any questions or concerns, you're welcome to post them there. And then if you're interested in learning more about the Hortonworks Data Platform and Hortonworks Data Flow, so HDP and HDF that we talked about today, feel free to sign up for a uh, use case workshop. And you can send us a note as you're at hortonworks.com, and we will get you set up uh, with your local team that can help do that on site for you as well. Awesome. So on the question front then, so first yeah. question is, can you tell us a little bit about what the difference between HDP and HD Insight is? Okay, that's actually an awesome question. Um, and the difference is, uh, the good news is the difference is very little. Uh, it's, it's HD Insight is built on HDP, so all the different pieces or most of the different pieces that you saw today, like Ambari, like all the different services, you still get with HD Insight, right? But it is offered as a software as a service uh, offering from Microsoft. So Microsoft has tested it, had done additional testing on HDP, and they are willing to kind of back it up with their support and they even have agreements with us for tier three support so we also back it up on top of microsoft uh, so if you are a hd insight customer in case you have questions queries issues we kind of uh, back you up on that and um and you know talking about um, you know just to tie it to uh, hortonworks community connection that you talked about let me show you I means uh, if you have questions on um, even HD Insight or HDP, if you go to community. dot dot com, that's the direct URL. Uh, if I can spell community correctly, 
and uh, and you, you can ask questions. So if you even if you have question about HD Insight, you can ask here. So here all this all the committers and um, uh, you can see there are so many questions uh, on HD Insight. Uh, of course, there are various uh, things about H HD P and HDF. For example, if you go to Code Hub, uh, there are um, uh, you know various NiFi processors for say OpenCV. Um, uh, these are some NiFi templates clients. Uh, so there, it's it's a treasure trove of cool stuff. I call it. <laughs> and uh, and you can ask any questions if if that question hasn't been already been asked. If you ask a question, most likely you'll get an answer very quickly because all the all our engineers and committers are just hanging out. Uh, there and interacting with uh, all the users. So, um, yeah, hopefully I that was a long way of answering uh, your question, but uh, yeah, hopefully I answered it. Perfect. Okay. okay, so next question for you then that we have. I'm hearing so much about Spark in the big data community today. Can you talk about how Spark works with HDP? Absolutely. So, yeah, Spark is an extremely important component of HDP. So we have committers on Spark and we are actively uh, working on uh, making Spark better uh, on various fronts, right? So we already work really hard to make sure uh, Spark can share resources on a Yarn cluster. So what that lets you do is uh, Spark is great for running uh, um, applications which uh, benefit from in-memory. Uh, so, um, typically those kind of applications have iterative algorithms. Uh, for example, machine learning, alg ma machine learning applications uh, tend to be, have those iterative algorithms where they have, they load a data set and then they keep on applying a model with various parameters on that same data set. So, it is iterative to kind of um, optimize the optimize the parameters. Uh, so those kind of applications benefit a lot from um, uh, 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 from Spark. And those can share the space on the Yarn cluster with, say, Hive. So Hive you, is a, a very mature uh, uh, SQL on Hadoop technology, which can really, really scale. Right? It can, you can have thousands of nodes. You can have uh, literally hundreds of terabytes, if not, uh, you know, petabytes of data on which you can query from. Uh, you can also have HBase, which has, which can uh, provide you uh, uh, subsequent queries on super large data sets. Now, all of this can share the space and integrate together uh, on a yarn cluster. So, um, uh, so each one has its place and use case. We uh, typically people tend to think of each one of these technologies as a silver bullet, but it's not. Uh, you know, carefully look at your scenario and then use the right technology. But uh, you can use all these various technology on Yarn. That's the or uh, Yarn on HD Insight or HDP, as as the case might be. Okay. Thank you. So next question, you talked a little bit about Polybase earlier. Yes. And with the general availability of SQL Server 2016 coming up on June 1st, can you expand a little bit on that as a lot of the customers out there have um, a lot of SQL familiarity in their businesses? Yeah, the, um, that's again an excellent question. And uh, again, Polybase is supported with HTTP either on-prem or on the cloud. Uh, so um, yeah, it's a... Uh, um, you know how I think about Polybase is with Polybase. If you are a SQL geek or popular head, T SQL popular head, you have uh, tons of uh, SQL scripts. You don't have to change the SQL scripts, right? Those SQL scripts work out of the box. It gives first class support for T SQL to be able to query across Hadoop clusters and SQL Server data warehouse, whether these are on prem or on the cloud. And it's in intelligent enough to push down the predicates 
down to Hadoop whenever required so that it can benefit from the performance gains, from the ability to really scale out on a distributed platform. So I hope that kind of provides you a kind of uh, enough uh, information. I, I myself is really, really, uh, uh, I love, love SQL Server. I am very uh, comfortable. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh, I, I l like the fact that now I can really, really use my SQL skills with Hadoop. Perfect. And then one final question coming in. Uh, as you look across Azure use case scenarios, what are the most common use case scenarios you're seeing um, customers leveraging on Azure today? So a very common use case is, of course, uh, uh, what we typically call cloud burst, right? So many, many of our customers, uh, let's say, have a on-prem HDP cluster, right? Uh, and, and they want geo redundancy of their data. A very easy way to have that geo redundancy of that data is to also store that data on Blob Store or other data stores on Azure. Now, every now and then, say every quarter or every month, they want to be able to do run queries on that data, even on the cloud. At that point, they can spin up a HD Insight cluster because their data is already there and um, and run queries on uh, that data that's already there. That's a common use case. The other very common use case is, of course, um, all these web properties, right? So if you are a startup today or if you are even a big company creating a new mobile app and whatnot, right, or an, even uh, a new line of business I means, uh, for example, one of the uh, major uh, soft drink manufacturers, they had this little boxes or vending machines, you know who I'm talking about, yeah. right? <laughs> where you can mix flavors of your drinks. And those machines have sensors which are sending back data from all around the world. A natural place to process and do data analytics on that kind of data is in the cloud because their machines are in every McDonald's in the United States and uh, various places um, across the world. And so they need to go, you know, bring that data up in the cloud and be able to be able to process that. So that's another very common use case. I, that's why IoT is such a common use case, whether it's your mobile apps, whether it's other kind of sensors, it makes sense to process that data on the HD Insight or HDP platform on the cloud. Great, thanks so much. So that concludes uh, all the questions that we currently have. Thanks for joining us today.